What if I told you that the deepest secrets of ancient climates millions of years ago are locked inside tiny fossils? Well, in this episode, we're going to vaporize a fossil with a laser beam to find out. Welcome to this episode of Every Rock Has a Story. Casey, and this is the rock of the day. What I see is this rock sort of looks like candy in, in the inside with like chocolate and toffee. And also, I think it's sedimentary because you can see on the side the layers. It looks kind and it looks kind of flat. What I'm wondering is why does it look so much like candy? Like it really looks like candy. Hey, Ethan, can you tell me the story of this rock? Thanks, KC, for introducing this rock to everybody. Hi, guys at home. Let's take a careful look at this rock together. KC said that this looked like candy. It's not candy, KC, but I think I see what she was talking about. If we look here really closely, there are those layers, those alternating light and dark tan layers, even white, and see how flat and straight they are. Those kind of flat, straight layers are exactly what we expect to see in a sedimentary rock. Casey got that right. This sedimentary rock was probably laid down on the bottom of a very quiet, gentle place, like maybe the bottom of a lake or a pond. A sedimentary rock like this, with those layers at the bottom of a quiet, quiet lake or sea, we call this rock a chert. Chert. Now, I'm gonna put this chert on our rock spinner and then I want to tell you some more about this particular rock. We've seen rocks kind of like this chert in some other episodes. It's a little bit like what Hillary showed us in episode 52 when we saw diatomaceous earth. But what it has in common are fossils. Tiny fossils, micro fossils, finer than the eye can see. And that's what makes a chert like this one so interesting. Now, I have a scientist friend and he studies fossils, microfossils that he extracts from cherts like this to learn about the ancient past. I'd like to take a journey there to his laboratory to see how he extracts information from those microfossils. Let's take that journey together now. Hey, Dan. Hi. Good to see you. Yeah. Thanks for having us here and enjoying this episode of Every Rock Has a Story. Everybody, I'm with Dan Ibarra. Dan is a professor at Brown University, which is where we are right now. And uh, Dan, we brought this sample from the studio to show you. Could we take a look at your lab and have you explain to us what you do with samples like this? For sure. Let's go check it out. All right, sweet. Yeah. So we're going in the lab. We got a secret code. All right. So this is a, a geochemistry lab. Where geochemistry. We, yep, we analyze the chemistry of rock samples in this lab. Like this one? Like this one right here. That's let's right. take a look, so what do we do? Sure, so let's come over to the lab bench over here. Okay. So we do a variety of things with rocks like this. So this rock has been squished and solidified over millions of years. How old is this rock? This rock's about 40 million years old. How do you make a rock like this, like in nature? What yeah, so rocks like this actually come from sediments, like you can see in this bag here. Yeah. So this is a sediment actually from the Great Salt Lake, where they drilled a core into the, into the lake, um, and it's about 100,000 years old. Mm -hmm. Okay, and yeah. you're saying that basically, if you took that stuff at the bottom of the Great Salt Lake and waited maybe 40 million years, it would turn into a rock like this one. That's right. Mm -hmm. Got it. So today I'll show you some ostracod fossils that we can extract from sediment like this that we analyze the chemistry of. So there's fossils in there and there's, do you think there's fossils in this rock too? There's probably some fossils in there. There's certainly uh, fossil organic matter as well. That's what some of those dark layers might be. So how do you get the fossils out? So what we do is we sieve them and then under the microscope we can actually pick them out and uh, purify them. Oh, can you show us? Yeah, let's go look at the microscope. Let's do it. Yeah, so here's what these ostracods look like. So an ostracod, um, it's sort of, you can think of it as kind of like a shrimp. And it lives in lakes. It also, they also live in, in streams and in, and in the ocean. But in particular, we're interested in the ostracods that live in these ancient lakes 
and what we're analyzing is actually their shells. Why are you doing this? What, what stories will these ostracods tell you? So we study past climate. So what we want to do is we want to reconstruct past climate in the Western United States for different time periods in the past, like 100,000 years ago or 40 million years ago. 40 million years ago with an older one. So what we're interested in is actually the oxygen that's encoded in these fossil shells back when they were formed. So how do you get the oxygen out of there to analyze it? So we actually use this big line that you can see here. Yeah. It's a line that lets us take rock and vaporize it into oxygen gas. Can we do this? Can you do an example and show us how this works? For sure, you're gonna have to put your gla safety glasses on and then I'll spin it up. Let's do it. The sample is sitting down here underneath the laser. So we're gonna use a laser? That's right, so this big black box right here is a laser. And no chemistry happens at room temperature for this type of reaction. We actually have to superheat the sample. So we're gonna use the laser to superheat the sample. Let's oh, we gotta it. see this. Yeah, all right. So what you can see is that you've got the little chert samples right here, and I'm gonna turn the laser on. And you're gonna watch this sample basically go from rock to gas. And so here we go. So what's happening? So what you can see is that it's gonna start glowing Whoa. very slowly. You see Look that at it red? Glow. And you can see the pressure is starting to rise, and I'm gonna keep increasing the power of the laser. So, so you're zapping it with a laser right now. I'm zapping it with and a- you're super, Whoa, look at that. There we go. So and it's getting superheated. It's, getting it's superheated. It's getting vaporized. That's right. You're turning it into gas. I'm turning that sample into gas. And in a second, we'll be all done, and there won't be any sample left. It's, it's gone. It's gone, it's almost gone. There we go, so you can see there's just a little bit of it left right there. Oh, look at it going away. And then there's the very last of the sample dissolving away. This is awesome. So now where did all that oxygen go? So that oxygen, you can see that that pressure is now higher than it was before. Right. And so now it's in the vacuum line. What's so next, next? next we have to purify it. More chemistry? More chemistry, that's right. And we need to freeze it down with liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen? Yep. That's cold. That's cold, yep. So you're doing gas chemistry. That's right. This is basically gas chemistry to analyze the geochemistry of these rocks. Wow. Now we're gonna have our purified oxygen. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send it over to the mass spectrometer. Okay. This is what allows you to create the data that you'll actually use to analyze past climate in the West United States. That's right. Wow. So Dan, how did you get interested in the geosciences to begin with? Yeah, so I think the start of it for me was I grew up around the corner from the Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana. No way. Yeah, and um, I remember on a rainy day, my parents would bring me there to look through this glass window where paleontologists were working on dinosaur fossils and basically, you know, cleaning them off. And dinosaur fossils, it's always the dinosaur. I know, but it wasn't, I didn't think I was gonna be a geologist when I went to college, and I thought I would be an engineer. Um, and it turned out that my first couple classes in undergraduate were in earth science related topics, specifically about the California gold rush and about, wow. um, you know, uh, past climate changes, sort of what I study now actually. And somehow from there, it just led on to me, you know, having a love for doing this type of work. So you got excited by giant fossils like the dinosaurs, yeah. and now you work on teeny tiny little fossils and rocks like this. That's right. That's yeah. a great story, Dan. I love it. And thank you so much for showing us your lab, for showing us all this stuff. Thanks for being part of Every Rock Has a Story. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, Ethan. Dan. Yeah. You guys, do you realize we just saw Dan Ibarra vaporize a fossil rock with a laser beam, put it in a mass spectrometer, the smoke and the gas coming out of the liquid nitrogen, all to get the data from the fossils in this rock to help us learn about Earth's ancient climate past. Really exciting laboratory science, and you got to be a part of it. If you're making a science journal page at home, and I hope you are, draw a picture of the rock, write its name, draw a picture of Dan, the scientist, doing his work in the lab and the story that came from it. You know, the kind of work that Dan does with rocks like these in understanding our past climates is really important to understand how our climate system works today. I want to say another big thanks to Dan for sharing his lab and his stories with us. And I want to remember that the story began with this rock and with Casey in her observations that this was a sedimentary rock representing the ancient past. 
I'll see you at our next episode. Bye-bye.